having me here. Thank you, Trilog. It's a great event. There are a lot of people here. Um, this could have a lot of uh, good ramifications for the sector. So. Um, just to re mention again, I'm from the Bertha Center for Social Innovation at UCT. We are very interested in market building around impact investing um, and have actually designed a number of blended finance instruments. In addition to that, we're providing a secretariat for the National Task Force for Impact Investing. Monique alluded to that. I'll talk about that a little bit at the end. Today, I'm going to chat about innovative financing models and specifically blended finance. Now, um, I'm going to try not repeat what people before me have said, but I want to make this very relevant to you guys in the room. And so you've kind of absorbed quite a lot of information, so what do you do with it? First of all, how do you organize it in your head? And then secondly, how do you start to put it into practice? What does that journey look like? And um, I started out with this slide. You might know exactly what I'm talking about, but for those who don't, I do find it helpful sometimes to be able to uh, describe the different types of capital across the investment spectrum, starting from finance first, and then going towards impact first, which which is what the majority of you guys are working in, being from corporate trusts, foundations, CSI, etc. Most of the money in the, in the world is sitting in traditional markets, 75% of it, they don't care about impact. 25% care at least about the environment, uh, their employees, and the way that decisions are made, governance decisions. 1% is going into impact investing. Impact investing is money that's going into businesses that specifically want to address the sustainable development goals. So Zini talked about that. She talked about ABSA's strategy around financial inclusion, etc. That's the 1% that I'm talking about. When we get to philanthropy, obviously, you, you know, that's, that's a, a subject that many in this room know, know a lot about. And that's not only coming from donors, it's also coming from government, 100% impact. If I think about the pots of capital that a lot of you are representing, pots of money, a, a, a lot of that is aligned to the BE codes. Um, and again, at, uh, at risk of telling you what you already know, if I'm to stick that onto the spectrum, um, if we think about the, the um, broad-based trusts, uh, usually they're endowed with a single stock, a single underlying stock of a corporate. So there's not a lot kind of strategically that you can do with that investment, and we'd probably stick that along the traditional responsible um, part of the spectrum. If we think about skills development levy, it's now going into, obviously, skills development and tertiary education, um, and could be considered to, to, to you know, sit with an impact in philanthropy. ESD funding, Enterprise Supply Development Funding, is distributed as a soft loan to SMEs. We would certainly consider that impact. That is additional to those SMEs. They don't usually, uh, they can't raise that money from the bank. And then finally, the, the SED funding, that 1% of net profit after tax, the, the, the money on which the Trilog Handbook is based, you know, that's, that's, that's grant funding. Um, now, as I said, the majority of, of this, this room are, are sitting in that area. Okay, so what can we do with that capital? How can we make it, we, we, you know, we keep using the word catalytic, blended finance. Um, blended finance, basically all that means is that you are using public philanthropic money to increase private sector development, in, uh, private sector investment in sustainable development. You're using that money to leverage additional money. We call it catalytic because it's basically transformative. It, it, it does more than simply the direct investment would suggest. You, 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 you're, you're mushrooming, that, that money is mushrooming and, and quite often creating a market effect so others can follow. Blended finance is not, it's not impact investing, it's, it's a structuring mechanism. It how, it's how you build uh, uh, it, it's how you, you, you um, add commercial funding to philanthropic funding to make more than the sum of the parts. Impact investing is an approach to investing, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, it's around solving environmental social problems. Okay, 
Um, I'm going to talk about four different types of blended finance instruments, give examples where foundations have specifically provided the uh, catalytic capital. When I'm talking through them, I want you to think about your own portfolios. I want you to think about what portion of your portfolios can be used in each of these four buckets. Um, so it's, we'll be looking at design grant, at your guarantee, at concessional funding, and at technical assistance funding. Uh, just for interest's sake, Convergence has put out a report around foundations, catalytic funding, and DFIs. Um, you'll see it, the second from the bottom is around corporate funding. All that's telling you is the average size of investment that corporate foundations are making into these types of deals, and it's $4 million, so 50 million rand about. The, I mean, the, the, the foundations that are doing this are the big the Rockefellers, the Gates, the um, Amidia, etc. cetera. Um, there, there obviously are some local examples, perhaps not at that scale yet. Okay, so if we think about a design grant, okay, what a design grant, well, we're thinking about blended finance instruments. So we're thinking about a grant that goes to an organization to help them design the instrument. Okay, well, why should you contribute to designing a financial instrument that seems like a strange thing for a grant funder to do? Well, Rockefeller's got a zero-gap portfolio worthwhile going to have a look at. They are funding the design of 45 instruments. What they hope to do is attract a billion dollars into each of those instruments. And I'm going to give you an example of one. It's called um, the African Green Co. And essentially what it is, it's, it's a guarantee that is extended towards investors um, when they invest in renewable energy projects across Africa, just in case the state utility does not end up buying their electricity. So what that does is it encourages the renewable energy companies to, uh, well, it, it encourages them to obviously grow, to seed and grow, but in environments where the state utility, for example, ESCOM, might not be so reliable, it ensures that there's offtake. So uh, hopefully you, you guys can connect the dots on why that's, that's important. There, are, there is a, um, <laughs> there, there is a, um, uh, a South African organization that, that has actually been granted some money in this portfolio, 18 East. They're creating a couple of things. One is a social stock exchange. The other is um, a way of listing SME, so small medium enterprise investments, on the London or the New York stock exchange. So it makes those investments tradable. They're, they're not tradable at the moment. It's an illiquid investment. And in this way, they can hopefully get more institutional money going into them. Okay, guarantees. So guarantees are, are put into the market for a number of reasons. One, to create a demonstration effect. So if you as a foundation believe that there's a business model out there, maybe an affordable housing business model, but no one's willing to put money in yet because they don't believe that it's commercially viable, then you can put money into that to attract commercial investment. For example, um, Tuff is a kind of inner city property developer, works quite a lot in Joburg, you might, you might have heard of them. They attracted a jobs fund grant, so not a foundations grant, but a, a jobs fund first loss guarantee, they were able to raise billions of rands off the back of that and on lend it to uh, sort of small scale entrepreneurs who then went in and, and developed these, um, uh, these properties. The second reason for a guarantee is if you believe the market is never going to be viable, but you want people to put lots of money into it anyway, so you're willing to cushion that. Um, a great international example is, is, in, is, is relatively new, International Finance Facility for Education. Basically, um, low, there's, there's an issue in the market. Low middle income countries, South Africa's not included in that. Um, are, they're, they're cutting aid to those particular countries and, and quite often they use that aid to build their education system, for example. So what's happening is developed countries, so governments, are providing a first loss guarantee to attract development finance capital, four times the amount that was provided as a guarantee, and then what that facility can do is lend it to lower middle income country governments like Ghana, like Guatemala, um, like Pakistan, in order to build the infrastructure around their education system. So this is, this is how people are starting to think about ways that money move, moves. 
Concessional funding, um, concessional funding is basically just interest, uh, investment that is lent out at a lower interest rate or more flexible terms, maybe longer terms than, than normal commercial funding. So for example, a commercial funder might loan, make a loan at prime plus five, 15%. A, a concessional funder, so ESD funding is, is part of that equation, they would loan their money out at 0%. When you, when you combine that money together, you can loan it out to SMEs at a preferential rate. Um, I, I haven't been paid by ABS to say this, but they've done a very interesting model in their ESD funding. They've actually attracted their retail bank funding to augment their ESD funding, so they're just their regular ESD funding, they've doubled the amount that is now available to black-owned SMEs in, in corporate supply chains. So that's, that's a way that uh, the, you know, corporate ESD funding can be uh, kind of synergistically used within an organization to build this kind of development portfolio. Finally, technical assistance. I think the, the, the World Bank estimates that um, for every um, 10, uh, basically when you, when you invest into an SME, um, you require, on average, 10% of that money to be um, granted or loaned to that business to provide business development support. So if you are investing or providing a million uh, rand loan into a small renewables energy company business, they actually need an extra 100,000 rand to ensure that they not only grow, but they sustain operations and that they survive. That is the, that is the average that has been calculated. Now, you might think that's a lot, but actually the US aid pace a facility has worked out that what that funding does is that it increases revenues on average by 70%. And it increases job creation on average by the same 70%. And so that's actually a pretty good investment for uh, simply topping it up by an, another 10%. Okay, so I hope what I've shared with you today, and it's been probably quite a lot of information, um, is kind of getting you thinking and oiling those cogs. Um, the question, I suppose, now is so, like, so, so what? So you, have, you, have, um, you have an idea of, of what Abs is doing. Obviously, Monique shared her personal journey, and she has leverage over you know, one of the largest um, asset managers of the continent. You're in this room, obviously, by virtue of the fact that you have aligned values. We, I think that our, our values tend to align, certainly the people that I've spoken to. Where is your um, realm of, of um, uh, influence? And, and how can you start applying this to your, to your own portfolios? So the first is, well, maybe this is the first you've heard of it. And so upskill, train, like, I have to end soon. OK. Um, you know, w what's out there in terms of, of, of training and so on? The, um, the, the second thing is to, to maybe get involved in some of the collaborative market building um, uh, uh, things that are happening. So for instance, the National Task Force for Impact Investing has a specific working group focus on foundations. Chat to me afterwards if you're interested in that. Internal discussions within your own company. So how do you go to the community trust, to the ESD fund, to the asset manager to say, hey guys, where are the synergies? Um, and then alternatively, when stuff comes on the market, get stuck in. Bonds for jobs, for example. You know, those guys are going to go out for another fundraising drive. Like, how can you use your capital to, to leverage additional commercial capital for stuff that's already being designed in the market? So thank you very much for having me, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you.